Thank you so much, Melissa, for that lovely introduction and also for the invitation. Um, I was so pleased to get the invitation, especially as I have read your work as well, and I know we have a lot of overlapping research interests. And it's really lovely to see people joining from all over the place as well. Um, and thanks also to um, Cynthia, who put in a lot of um, work before the, to make this happen as well. So I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my start. Okay. So in my field of South Asian studies, family history is a rich but relatively small field compared with many other historical disciplines, sub-disciplines. Um, and many historical analyses of family and households have been framed in terms of histories of gender, um, sexuality or labour. And of course, these are really vital analytical lenses, but there is certainly further room for um, examination of family history methodologies. Some other disciplines have perhaps been more engaged with the contingent meaning of family. Anthropologists, for instance, have critically appraised how the anthropological concepts of kinship that developed in the 19th and 20th centuries were embedded with culturally and historically specific assumptions, which were partly a product of colonialism. Although I'm merely a sideline observer of these um, discussions in anthropology, I think this talk will resonate with some of those discussions as well. So my talk today, my talk today draws on some of the material in my 2019 book, but reframes it um, in terms of family history, literature and methodologies. I ask, how does thinking with Hitra history raise questions for the history of the family more generally. So, let me see. Hedras are a community who are often members of households structured by discipleship hierarchies. As anthropologist Gayatri Reddy described, they adopt cultural symbols that are either feminine or a combination of masculine and feminine. In the 19th century, Hedras were criminalized by the colonial state with the backing of certain elite Indian men. One reason for this was that their households were denied the status of the familial. 19th century sources written by British colonizers and relatively elite Indian men sought to separate out the category of kin kinship from Hydra discipleship, defining Hydra households as not families, while equating discipleship with enslavement. To understand the history of Hydra households, we evidently need to decenter concepts of family that became dominant in 19th century South Asia, which privileged reproductive sexuality, conjugality, and patrilineal succession. Hydra histories raise questions about the history of the concept of family and who is counted as family. Moreover, we need to consider how various ties between people have been translated into particular categories of relationships in the past and in the present. Hydra histories also remind us that we need to consider the variability of gender. In analysing Hydra's relationships, I found that family history and transgender studies can productively be brought into conversation. So I'm going to discuss how I've analysed Hydra histories in conversation with these fields. Then in the conclusion, I'm going to turn to some questions about translation that certain family history um, and transgender studies scholars have raised, which I think prompt methodological challenges that I'm still grappling with, and which raise some um, pertinent questions for Asian studies scholars generally. But first, um, some context on the Hydra community. So Hydras have historically performed collective donations and given congratulatory blessings for prosperity and fertility at the times of births, weddings, and other festive occasions, a practice that's known as Batai. Um, Hadiel Singh noted in his 1894 ethnography of Mawar, that they sing and dance their music consisting of tolak, a small two-sided drum, and majiris, or cymbals. They chiefly clap their hands when they sing. 
In addition to Batai, uh, 19th century hijras also had various forms of work and income, in particular um, agricultural cultivation, agricultural labour and animal husbandry. Their financial means also varied. 19th century sources mention hijras who lived in pakka or well-built houses, as well as kacha or makeshift houses. Uh, they were often assigned male gender at birth and expressed femininity through clothing, gestures, behaviours and language use, sometimes in combination with masculinity. In the 19th century, some hijras were described as being castrated, others as having been um, born as hijras. They were often members of discipleship lineages of gurus and chelas or disciples, um, and many lived in discipleship-based households. Different lineages had distinct territories in which they could do batai in a particular area. And it seems that Pedro gurus were often described through a language of motherhood or fatherhood. And we also see um, members of households described as aunts, nieces, and so on. And I'll talk more about this later. So now, just to start this off, I'm going to give a brief sketch of the broader fields that I'm engaging with in this talk. So family history and transgender studies, particularly focused on the literature from South Asia. So there has been some excellent work in family history, but as I mentioned, it is a relatively small field, particularly if we were to think like comparatively to say gender studies or sexuality studies or history of labor. Um, I'm just going to point out a few key things. So there's been several studies of courtly cultures in South Asia that have shown the significance of royal households to political structures and studies on various periods. As you can see here, um, the work of Dora Lee, Ruby Lal, and Andranu Chatterjee are some examples. There's also been several histories of family that have examined various dimensions of colonialism and the history of the family especially um, relationships between European men and Indian women, um, as in Dover Ghosh and Jane McCabe studies, but also other dimensions of colonialism and family history. Third, there's been numerous studies that have examined the ideologies of domesticity and familial relationships of educated, relatively high status groups who increasingly identified as middle class and also in Bengal of the Bhadralok in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this literature probably represents the bulk of the literature and family history for my period from 1850 to 1950. And conjugality in particular has been a focus of this literature compared with other familial relationships. Finally, um, while most um, existing family histories, or at least the majority, have examined relatively elite social groups. Um, studies of domestic servants have highlighted class and caste hierarchies within households. And these four things I've picked out are, I think, particularly prominent. So this is not exhaustive, um, but I think these are four areas where there is a lot of scholarship. So one of the most sophisticated and I think really interesting considerations of South Asian family history methods is Unfamiliar Relation, a 2004 collection edited by Andrani Chatterjee. Chatterjee pointed out that the emphasis in a lot of the literature that existed in 2004 um, on family colonialism and nationalism, which has continued to be um, an emphasis in a lot of literature, that this literature had directed attention to the ideological production of the family in the late 19th and 20th century, which emphasized conjugality and effect. But she pointed out that this had obscured friendship, patronage, service relationships, and um, stratification within households. So building on strategy, I think there's room for more reflections on method, um, especially since several existing studies have not really theorized family history as such, but rather foregrounded other analytical categories like gender. And moreover, I think the, the households of relatively elite social groups have been the overwhelming focus. So broadening the context in which we look for family histories is important. 
The interdis interdisciplinary literature on the hydro community that has emerged since the 1990s is, I think, interesting for family historians to think with, since this literature foregrounds varied languages of relatedness and highly contingent patterns of relationships. So in her important study of the Hydra community in Hyderabad, Gayatri Reddy critiqued scholars who had framed Hydras in terms of sexual difference, which she argued did not encapsulate their multiple axes of identity, including religion, gender, kinship, and class. She argued that Hydras were deeply implicated in the local moral economy of visit or respect, which was central to the construction of their identity. Reddy also noted that Hydras Karanas or households, their guru chela relationships and kinship with other hijras were central to hijra is it. So other scholars from anthropology, linguistics, theatre studies, and musicology have also emphasized the importance of guru chela relationships and the relationships within households as well. However, in their research on Bengal, Anuguru Datta has suggested that emphasizing, quote, lineage-based hydra kinship obscures lower class networks of diverse gender, um, sexually marginalized people outside of Karana households who have complex relationships of overlap or distinction from the hydra category. Um, people outside lineage-based households challenge the demarcated territories of different Hydra lineages, but are also sometimes accommodated by those lineages, which produces an uneven and ruptured territori territoriality, as they put it. Moreover, Adnan Hossein's research highlights that while existing literature locates the Hydra outside of normative kinship and procreative heterosexuality, and I'm quoting here, Many Hydras in Dhaka are married to women and simultaneously perform the role of heterosexual masculine householders and that of Hydra. So I think um, Datta and Hossein's work alerts us to the very contingent relationships between discipleship, lineages, multiple forms of kinship, and Hydra affiliation and identity in the present. This literature on contemporary hijras has been increasingly engaged with transgender studies, which has emerged in the last two decades as a field of interdisciplinary research. So as the field's, um, one of, at least one of the field's major journals, Transgender Studies Quarterly explains, uh, transgender studies examines how transgender comes into play as a category, a process, a social assemblage, an identity, and a rubric for understanding the variability and contingency of gender across time, space, and cultures. Transgender studies has been shaped by queer studies um, and feminist uh, scholarship, but it's also a critique of how those fields have analyzed um, quote, the diversity of gender, sex, sexuality, embodiment, and identity, as TSQ puts it. So there are many ways, I think, that transgender studies and family histories can productively intersect. Some of the most interesting work from both fields has historicized and decentered normative concepts of family. In particular, both historians and trans transgender studies scholars have shown the historical and cultural specificity of households based on conjugality and heterosexual reproductive sexuality. That is, family history and transgender studies can question the definite article in the history of the, of the family. These fields unsettle the family by showing the historical contingency of familial concepts and diverse um, practices of kinship making. Furthermore, transgender studies reminds us, family historians, that to understand households and relationships, we need to think critically about the gender categories that appear in our sources and also um, diverse forms of gender expression, which those sources may or may not um, sort of reveal to us. We need to historicize binary concepts of gender and understand, um, as TSQ puts it, the variability and contingency of gender across time, space, and cultures, if we are to understand family histories. So in the conclusion, I'm going to return to this consideration of convergences between transgender studies and 
um, family history and comment on some questions about translation that have emerged from each of these fields. But first I want to consider how do life Hydra life histories in 19th century archives raise questions for the fields of family history. So the colonial criminalization of hydras as eunuchs in um, the late 19th century produced a substantial archive of narratives about the hydra community, including in government correspondence, ethnographies, medical texts, and to a lesser extent, articles in English, Hindi, and Urdu newspapers. The dominant colonial narrative was that hydras were ungovernable in multiple intersecting ways. They were apparently sexually immoral, challenged colonial concepts of binary gender, corrupted public space with obscene performances, undermined the stability of political borders through their travels for their time, which were actually of um, quite short distance, it seems. And the British also claimed that Hydras kidnapped and castrated Indian boys. The colonial government used the disparaging term eunuch for Hydras, which framed them as men, reinforcing binary gender and obscuring Hydras gender expression. Elite North Indian men did not experience a major moral panic about the Hydra community, but some wrote about Hydras in newspapers and government correspondence. In the late 1800s, educated high caste or high status Indians increasingly identified as middle class, and such middle class men portrayed Hydras in strikingly similar ways as British commentators, but they particularly claimed that Hydras kidnapped, enslaved, and castrated Indian boys. And I'll deal with that discourse later on in the talk. They also called for police registration, banishment, or quarantining of Hydras. In 1865, the government of the Northwestern Provinces, or today is Uttar Pradesh, which you can see on the map, launched a campaign to eliminate so-called eunuchs by preventing Hydra initiation and castration, which colonial officials equated. In 1871, part two of the Criminal Tribes Act, which you can see on the slide, criminalized eunuchs and um, provided for police registration, interference with Hydra succession and inheritance, the forced removal of male assigned children of 17 or under from registered eunuchs households and cultural elimination through prevention of performance and feminine dress in public. And whenever I use the term eunuch, I'm sort of using scare quotes. Um, but I can't go like that every time. So this context of criminalization produced a substantial state archive about the Hydra community. Close attention to archival practices shows the messiness and the multiplicity of the ways that Hydra's relationships and households were narrated. When, whereas published texts, newspapers, and upper level government records present more abstract forms of knowledge, the multi layered and disaggregated colonial state archives reveal multiple and contested narratives about Hydras beyond the dominant colonial and middle class Indian accounts. However, what survives of these official records is overwhelmingly in English, and translation was central to processes of knowledge production. Colonial knowledge was a product of interactions with local people who were considered to be knowledgeable about the Hydra community, including respectable prominent men, like uh, respectable was the term that the colonial officials used. So respectable men like landlords and commercial magnates, but also lower status people such as village headmen, neighborhood watchmen, and Hydras themselves. It is especially in district level official records that we find fragments um, of multiple and complex narratives about Hydra's relationships and households. These files were classified as matters of routine, not matters of importance. That is, they were constructed as the periphery of the official colonial archive. District level archives play, contain um, police registers that recorded short biographies of eunuchs, and you can see an especially sort of brief um, register on the slide here. These life histories, which were often fragmentary, did challenge the co collectivizing tendencies of most 19th century accounts and complicated authoritative colonial narratives and middle-class Indian stereotypes. Police registers often reduced the lives of Hydras to a handful of classes of information that had a PC purpose. 
that occasionally a colonial official failed to follow the prescribed formula for recording Hydra's biographies, introducing different narratives about Hydra's relationships and households and troubling the sweeping categories of colonial rule. And I'll just quickly show you, so this is an example of a much more detailed register, which I'll return to later in the talk. However, most black histories were recorded, recorded as accounts of eunuchs, not as Hydra's. The records suggest that most registered people identified as Hydra's, but male performers who performed female roles, male devotees who embodied femininity in religious rituals, and Zanata's um, so-called effeminate men who were often performers were also sometimes categorized as eunuchs. When colonial officials did use the term Hydra, they applied that label according to the logic of colonial assumptions about Hydrahood, not necessarily because an individual had described themselves as such. Moreover, the slippage in colonial archives between Hydra, other affiliations, and eunuch highlights the importance of questions about translation between languages, but also between categories. Any ascription of Hydra identity to historical subjects is necessarily tentative and uncertain. So how were Hydra's or eunuch's relationships and households narrated and archived? The accounts of colonial officials and middle-class Indian men often separate out kinship as a distinct type of relationship from discipleship, while equating discipleship with enslavement. These accounts push the historian to not think about Hydra histories as related to family histories. Yet the imperative to render social relationships legible constantly pushed against the categorization of Hydra households as not familial. Local level official archives frequently undermined neat distinctions between different categories of relationships and recorded various ways of describing relationships in which people were enmeshed. The life histories on police registers frequently mention discipleship connections using the terms um, guru, teacher, pupil, disciple, and chela. One especially detailed register from Muzapanaga district, which I showed you the image of before. Um, on most, most of the entries on that Muzapanaga district register noted the knowledge traditions through which training in singing and dancing was passed down from so-called teachers to pupils. Many police registers mention households containing several people linked by discipleship relationships. So this Muzawanaka uh, police register mentions that Amir Box was the tutor of Piari, uh, Jawaha and Wafafi, who lived together in a household in Jansa. The register also describes the previous generations of gurus in the household. Um, and some police registers mention Hydras who periodically moved between several households in which they had discipleship links, showing how lineages linked multiple households. Police registers also described people who did not live with other so-called eunuchs, though some mentioned their guru or their teacher, suggesting that they were or that they had been a part of a Hydra lineage. Of course, it's also usually unclear which registered eunuchs um, claimed an identity as Hydra, and people outside of discipleship lineages may have also described themselves as Hydra. So the people on the registers who don't mention tutors, uh, don't mention their teacher or their guru may also have claimed a, an identity as a Hydra or another social affiliation. It's, it's quite difficult to tell. Colonial officials viewed Hydra discipleship lineages as a subversive and seditious political structure, claiming that Hydras had a sort of um, acknowledged internal government. While this reflected an anxiety about potential challenges to the power of the colonial state, we can also view the Hydra community as a form of what Indrani Chatterjee calls monastic governmentality. In early modern India, lay donors made land grants to the heads of discipleship lineages who exercised sovereignty within these granted domains. Monastic estates were also household centered and discipleship lineages were often intertwined with marriage alliances between disciples. 
Hitras also had historically received small grants of land and allowances from Indian rulers, while Hidra households had defined territories in which they could collect donations, and in this sense had geographically delineated territories. But in the 19th century, communities based on discipleship lineages were increasingly marginalized because they did not fit the conjugal model of succession based on biological reproduction and centered on marriage, which the colonial state and middle-class Indians defined as the norm. Hidra discipleship lineages were not as economically significant and politically important as some um, Sufi, Vaishnav, Shiv, and um, Buddhist lineages. But Hidra households show us that monastic governmentality was wrapped up with the history of the household in less powerful communities too. The official archive and 19th century elite Indian accounts usually constructed Hidra discipleship as being distinct from or even antithetical to kinship and family. However, occasionally we find references to Hidras being in kinship relationships with other Hidras, as well as narratives that suggest that Guru Chalit eyes were conceptualized through a language of kinship. Uh, the Buland Shahar Register noted that 60 year old Hossein Baksh states that he has been and sorry, he is in the um, in the original um, most Hidras use um, feminine verb congregation. So I mostly use she, um, but the, the text says he. Um, so what was I? Hossein Baksh states that he has been a, uni a eunuch from birth and was taught singing and dancing by a eunuch who had adopted him. So here the term, the English term eunuch, uh, sorry, the English term adoption was used to describe relation the relationship between Hossein Baksh and um, the elder eunuch. Hence, Hidra discipleship appears to be described as adoptive kinship. In his ethnographic glossary of Punjab, Rose described a Hidra household in Panipat of um, seven or eight members who call one another by name, such as Masi, mother, sister, Pupi, uh, paternal aunt, and so on. This shows that Hidras referred to other Hidras through kinship terms, and additionally seems to suggest that a Hidra guru was envisaged as mother or father. Um, anthropological and activist literature suggests that gurus and other senior Hidras are often referred to as mother, and also according to linguist Kira Hall, the guru chela relationship is also sometimes discussed in terms of a father-son relationship. So there, there does seem to be some variability in terms of the different languages of kinship that um, were historically and um, are used in the present. But you know, it's pretty clear that in the 19th century, Hidra discipleship ties do seem to have been described through varied languages of kinship. Police registers and other official records mention a variety of kinship relationships within Hidra households. And, and the households of people registered as eunuchs. The 1881 Annual Report on the Implementation of the Criminal Tribes Act mentioned that four boys in a eunuch household were the sons of chalers living with eunuchs. Whether the sons were initiated into the Hydra lineage is unclear, as is the precise social meaning of the chalers relationship to these sons. The same report also mentioned that a boy was living with a eunuch who was his uncle um, uh, in, uh, in Gonda. So there's also examples of some Hidra initiates um, who were mentioned on police registers who had entered Hidra households along with, um, for instance, with a widowed mother or a brother. So it also seems that some Hidra initiates actually brought um, what was described as their natal families into Hidra households. In other instances, life histories record that Hidras had adopted or cared for young people who were not initiated into Hidra lineages and arranged their marriage to a suitable partner. So for instance, one um, person who was registered in Azamgarh district brought up a boy who became a married man and the father of a family. British officials and middle-class Indian men viewed the proper family of a Hidra initiate as their natal family, not other Hidras. State archives hence drew distinctions between adopted kin, biological kin, and discipleship. 
But the rough picture that emerges from these biological fragments is that Hydras often described their discipleship ties through a language of kinship. And additionally, that Hydras formed and man maintained kinship relationships with people who were not initiated into Hydra lineages. It's difficult to unpack how or if Hydras distinguished between different types of kinship, and I think the meaning of different types of kinship as well. But Gurucelli relationships and kinship relationships evidently overlapped, though, in highly contingent ways. Okay, so just the final set of examples I want to refer to are in relation to the issue of slavery. So archived life histories also pressed against the dominant colonial and elite Indian narrative that Hydras kidnapped, enslaved, and forcibly castrated children. State archives reflect the development of what Ashita Pandey has called an epistemic contract on age, wherein both Britons and Indians increasingly defined personhood through numerical age. However, it's unclear how Hydras understood different life stages, including childhood. Moreover, while colonial and middle-class Indian accounts equated Hydra initiation and discipleship with childhood kidnapping and enslavement, a more complex picture emerged from, emerges from biographical fragments on police registers. So the Muzaffarnagar district register, which you can see on the left there, includes multiple narratives of Hydra initiation. And these were shaped by the imperatives of the colonial state, but not entirely, and they sort of strain against those imperatives. So um, just to give a few examples, um, Kariman was reportedly kidnapped by a member of the um, Banjara itinerant transporter community at the age of seven um, and was sold to a eunuch. Kira's biography does not tell us anything about her life before the age of eight when she started to travel around northern India with two eunuchs. A hermaphrodite named Piari worked for a mukta or court pleader for 10 years and appears to have been um, around late teens um, when she went to Niadru Gunik at Jansat and had learned singing and dancing. Um, and Amir Fox, who was the um, guru of this household, um, lived with um, her mother until 14 years um, and then joined a Hydra community or went to a eunuch, as the register says. So Hydras and their neighbours reported to police that they had been initiated at a range of ages. Some bio biographies explicitly mentioned kidnapping and enslavement, others did not. There are numerous examples in official archives of the initiation of people who were defined as youth or adult by colonial officials. Um, although British bureaucrats assumed adult initiations were voluntary, it's difficult to determine the relationship between maturity and processes of enslavement. So evidently the relationship between discipleship and enslavement in Hydra households was highly contingent and it does seem to be uneven. As Richard Eaton argues, slavery was a particular origin, a particular career, and a particular relationship to a master rather than an unchanging status. Um, and that was certainly the case in Northern India. Moreover, slavery was intertwined with discipleship lineages in various social groups. North Indians had used the language of discipleship to describe relationships of enslavement since at least the 16th century. Slaves were interchangeably referred to as chelas, so I mean implicitly as disciples, um, and as adopted children, highlighting that slavery, discipleship, and kinship terms were discursively entangled and entangled in their sort of everyday usage. Conversely, many chelas in monastic lineages were acquired in childhood um, as slaves. So for instance, in the hierarchies of slavery and discipleship, um, sorry, in um, Gothen warrior ascetic communities, we see that hierarchies of slavery and discipleship often overlapped. And enslavement in childhood does not seem to have been a barrier to advancement within these, um, the hierarchies of these warrior ascetic communities. Similarly, enslaved people were probably among the people who were initiated into um, Hydra 
discipleship lineages, along with non enslaved people, reflecting these broader patterns of partial and contingent overlap between relationships of discipleship and enslavement um, in 19th century India. So to sum up, colonial and middle class Indian commentators push us to define Hidra discipleship as entirely distinct from kinship and to equate discipleship with enslavement. But district level official archives, especially life histories recorded on police registers, suggest a much messier and really highly contextual entanglement of different relationships. This tangle of relations highlights that family historians can productively work with broader and I think more capacious concepts as starting points than perhaps family and kinship or even household, um, which as we've seen might sort of marginalise some people who claim a Hydra identity but are not member, members of lineage-based households. The anthropological concept of relatedness, for instance, um, I've found a really useful springboard. So relatedness, in Janet Carsten's words, encapsulates those connections that carry particular weight socially, materially, effectively in a given context, relationships which may or may not be described in a language of kinship. I don't suggest relatedness to escape the colonial, casteist and classist histories of the concept of family, which is of course impossible. I suggest the concept of relatedness not so much as a category of analysis, but rather as a more capacious starting point, a question of analysis. Relatedness helps me to bring various relationships into a single field of analysis and poses the question, what are the significant connections between people in this context and how are they conceptualized? However, one of the trickiest questions that emerges from these archives of Hydra lives is the issue of translation and legibility. 19th century archives are undergirded by a logic of legibility, of making Hydra's bodies, practices, and relationships knowable, legible, and translatable. How can we sidestep or refuse this imperative to make historical Hydra's lives legible, and if so, how? How can we analyze 19th century Hydra's lives while thinking critically about translation into the present, into our analytical categories, and into classifications of different kinds of relationships? I'm sort of rethinking some of the interpretation I offered in my 2019 book, and in so doing, I found it really useful to turn to the reflections on translation of some family historians and transgender studies scholars. In the important edited collection, Unfamiliar Relations, Chatterjee warned scholars not to let the political entanglements of post-colonial nation states entrap them in an overdetermined interpretation of the past of the family. Hence, she asked, is it possible to resist the translation of strangeness into the familiarity of the here and now? In addition, Chatterjee highlighted the profusion of terms for family in various South Asian languages and the translation of these terms into analytical categories like kinship and household, which were shaped by colonial law and 19th, 19th to 20th century anthropology and sociology. Thus, Chatterjee raises questions about first, the imperative to translate between past and present, and second, the translation between polyvalent and profuse terms in multiple languages and scholars' English language analytical categories. Meanwhile, scholars working in transgender studies have raised questions about how transgender people's lives are translated. In a special issue on translating transgender, Aniruddha Dutta and David Bramling have asked a number of interesting questions, including how has a pressure to be translatable affected the lives, stories, ex and experiences of transgender persons, and what is the political consequence of those pressures? How does geopolitical and linguistic location shape the requirement to translate, for instance, to translate oneself into a transgender identity or the ability to escape the imperative of translation? Moreover, how is gender itself the domain of translational practice? Given these questions about the translation of transgender and more broadly of the concept of gender, these authors call for transgender studies to be as multilingual, as multidirectional, and linguistically centrifugal 
and as untranslatable as methodologically possible. This raises broader questions about how we translate historical subjects into gender categories and into the categories of relationships, which are pressing for family history as a field. These authors highlight the importance of multilinguality, or as Chatterjee puts it, polyglossia. Of course, this is particularly challenging for historians of marginalised people in the South Asian context, since colonial and missionary archives and elite Indian commentary in multiple languages um, are our main sources for the 1850 to 1950 period. Moreover, both Chatterjee and Dutter and Gramling raise questions about how scholars translate lives and practices into transnationally circulating English language categories in ways shaped by geopolitical and linguistic location. Of course, this highlights the broader challenge of Asian studies and other area studies, which are always in translation in a way that the history of Euro-America, especially the Anglosphere, is not. More specifically, this puts into question the ways that historians translate historical narratives of relationships into analytical categories such as family, kinship, gender, and so on. In different ways, both Chatterjee and um, Dutter and Gramling ask us to think about how we might suspend translation into the present and into transnationally valued concepts. So building on Dutter and Gramling in particular, I want to close by posing the question of whether and how Asian studies and family history specifically could allow people and their relationships to be as untranslatable as methodologically possible. Great, thank you.